Mining and forestry powered this region's economy for more than a century, and though they are still core industries, innovation and entrepreneurship are increasingly seen as vital to Northern Ontario's economic future. Joining us now on that, and how well the major political parties in this election have addressed the economic needs of the North, we are happy to welcome Alicia Woods, Director at the Centre for Excellence in Mining Innovation and General Manager at Marcotte Mining. Don Duval, CEO of NORCAT, that's a skills training and innovation centre. Dr. Dennis Reich, a physician, entrepreneur, and CEO of the clean tech startup Activated White, and Tom Vair, former head of Sault Ste. Marie's Innovation Center, now working in community development and enterprise services for that city. And it's great to welcome you all here to Laurentian University today for a conversation about breeding homegrown northern innovation. Just before we do that, I want to get a sense from you, Alicia, since you're in this business. Mining and the north, how essential has it been to the north's development over the last century? I mean, if you think of Sudbury, I mean, Sudbury was born out of mining. You know, I always tell people that I grew up mining. You know, my father, grandfather, and uncle were in the mining industry. Um, I really grew up in the shop that they had founded. If you talk to anybody in Sudbury, um, you know, most of their relatives are in the mining industry or in the service and supply sector industry. Is that why you love it? I love mining. I mean, there are so mining. many opportunities and challenges. <clears throat> Um, and I'm definitely really passionate about the industry and what it has to offer. I don't want to get off on, a, on too much of a tangent here, but the reality is, back in the day, never mind there were very few women in mining, women were not allowed in mining at all. Well, What's that's the story? What we well, definitely, it was considered actually bad luck for women to be underground. So, you know, I recall actually a female in the industry getting on the cage for the first time, and all the men on the cage actually got off. Because? Because it was considered bad luck to be underground with a huh. female. When did that change? Um, I think it was probably in the 80s or so, um, but it's certainly <laughs> been a lot of work to, uh, you know, have females accepted in the mining industry, but we are definitely headed in the right direction. Okay. Let's go to uh, just a little bit west of here to talk about Sault Ste. Marie for a second, and it won't be mining we'll be talking about, it'll be the steel industry that we're talking about in the Sioux and how key that was to the growth of that city. Absolutely. I mean, it was fundamental from uh, Francis H. Clerg back in the 1800s and uh, growing the city from there. It was 12,000 people that worked at the steel mill in the 80s, and we're down to about 2,700 now. So there's been a big shift in the economy in Sault Ste. Marie and the makeup of the city, but steel is by far the major employer and all the industries that service that mill as well. What would you say? Clearly, there are many fewer people being employed in steel in the Sioux now, but what's the state of the industry, generally speaking, in the Sioux? Well, Algoma Steel is, is just still emerging from CCAA. So, uh, it's not you even know, Algoma Steel anymore, is it? It's, it's Algoma, yeah. Hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the prices are up. The steel mill is hiring hundreds of people right now and growing, so things are looking good. Uh, but the uh, industry's gone through its regular cycles, and there's always concerns of tariffs and uh, new things that are emerging in the steel industry, which keeps everyone on their toes. So you guys don't love President Trump, I'm guessing, right now. <laughs> no comment. Yeah, no comment. <laughs> Safe answer. Yeah, Safe you don't answer. love the notion of 15 or 20 percent tariffs on your goods. We, we don't like that notion, no. Yeah, gotcha. Let's just share here with uh, numbers that you folks all know, but with our viewers at home, uh, evaluating the North's economy. And can we bring these graphics up here? Northern Ontario accounts for about 90 percent of Ontario's land mass but only 5% of its population, employment, and economic activity. The Greater Toronto Area, by comparison, accounts for nearly 50% of the province's GDP and employment. Northern Ontario has the, I'm sorry to say, least diversified economy in the province when compared to Central, Eastern, and Southwestern Ontario. From 2011, that's the year the Ontario government introduced the growth plan for the North, to 2016, there has been no major change in the diversity of Northern Ontario's economy. All those numbers from the Ontario Ministry of Finance. And if we take a look at the North's economic diversity when compared to Toronto's, we go down this chart here and all the blue bars are Toronto and the burgundy red bars, if you like, are Northern Ontario. And there are overlaps, just take a look at the top one, wholesale and retail trade, where it's very even. But then if you go a few more down, Look how health care and social assistance, how much more people depend on those sectors for employment in northern Ontario as opposed to down south in Toronto. And again, if you go to manufacturing, more of it in Toronto per capita than in, uh, in Toronto than the north, rather. And again, all the way down the rest of the chart, forestry, fishing, mining, quarrying, gas, obviously a lot more of it in northern Ontario as opposed to Toronto. So that's just a bit of a backgrounder that uh, will help us get to the next part of our discussion. NORCAT's Innovation Mill. What is that? So the Innovation Mill is fundamentally focused on working with community partners 
to either help start or accelerate the growth of tech-oriented businesses. So we define ourselves as an innovation center. And how's it going? Phenomenal. You know, over the last five years, we're proud to say that the Innovation Mill has been one of the fastest growing regional innovation centers across Canada. So that's a great indicator of, you know, is there a vibrant innovation economy in Sudbury? Well, we have the data that shows that. Uh, what's really unique about that, though, is it's a very diverse cohort of startups that we work with. So, you know, for example? Well, building on Alicia's comment, I think it's important, you know, to make no mistake. You know, we are the global leader for all that is mining tech and mining innovation. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have that reputation and we have all the components to make this a vibrant mining innovation cluster. In the world? Absolutely, hands down. Mm -hmm. and, and what's unique about it is if you think of all the elements that make this a vibrant cluster related to mining tech, we have them all and they're stitched together like no other community or ecosystem in the world. That all said, there is a vibrant, uh, uh, I guess, growth of other sectors that are evolving. So it might surprise you that beyond advanced manufacturing and mining, if you look at our portfolio of startups, the second, uh, second biggest cohort is medtech. And you reflect on that, go, well, how is that possible? Well, you keep in mind, we have one of the leading hospitals in Ontario at Health Sciences North. We have the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Health Sciences Research Institute. You have an aging population, so there's clearly a demand for some you know, interesting devices to support an aging population. So it's a really diverse cohort that we work with at the Innovation Mill. So how come all the news, or I shouldn't say all the news, but how come so much of the news we hear out of Northern Ontario is bad when you tell us things are so fantastic. Yeah. Well, keep in mind, the Innovation Mill is five years old, and you know, not five years ago, we had a very small cohort of startups. And the work that we do is critically important because you think of, uh, of the key drivers of job creation, two-thirds of all new jobs will be created by startups or small, medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. So prior to the Innovation Mill and other regional innovation centers across Northern Ontario, there was little, little mechanisms to support these companies to not only get started, but to grow and grow faster. So I think if you look back historically, I think you're right. I think a lot of the traditional industries, uh, you know, added jobs, went through the cyclical nature. But in the last five years, the foundation has been laid, the innovation centers and the various communities across Northern Ontario are working together to really listen to this burgeoning, still relatively new, still relatively small, but poised to do some incredible things in terms of driving sustainable job and wealth creation for all of Northern Ontario. So fast forward this question five years ago, look back, we will have material stories and material companies to point to that the innovation ecosystem has supported. Where do you think he's gonna be in five years? Well, I wish, you know, I had the Innovation Mill when I started covering Gallus, right? And that was just before that five years. And it certainly was a challenge as an entrepreneur, as a startup, to kind of navigate the system. Um, but we have, you know, engaged with the Innovation Mill and are participating. And so happy to see that that is in Sudbury. You just dropped a line there that some people may not know, but probably a lot of people watching down <laughs> south will know. Cover Gals. So what Cover is Gals is the female coverall. So having been in the industry for 18 years and being challenged with wearing men's workwear, didn't fit properly, didn't function, as you can imagine being underground for 10 hours and needing to use the bathroom, uh, it's a challenge with the traditional men's coverall. Hmm. So the Cover Girl essentially incorporates a rear trap door for easier bathroom breaks. And you invented it? Yes, I created a beta based on my own frustration in wearing men's workwear. How's it doing? It's doing well. Amazing. We actually had an opportunity to uh, take it to the Dragon's Den. Um, and since then, we've teamed up with distributors like Marksick Warehouse and Staples and Acklands Granger and Sintas, and working with a lot of major, not just mining companies, but other kinds of um, companies in construction, trades, forestry, and using it actually as a tool to attract and retain females. Dr. Reich, you've got something called Activated White. We do. What's that? Absolutely. Uh, activated White is a polymer resin that basically absorbs close to 80 times its weight in hydrocarbons. So, you know, we talk about about 100 years ago, we've, since then we've taken about a trillion barrels of oil out of the ground, and this material can help us recapture it because it's still above the ground now in our water, in our air, and in our soil. Um, and it does have utility in the mines as well. So give us an example of how that actually works. What do you do with it? So this can be put into cloth. Uh, it can be put into booms, it can be put into air filtration uh, units, and basically what it uh, does is you can actually, for the mining sector for example, if you have a water underground that has to be mixed with uh, oil to help drills uh, go into the ground, that water typically has to be recovered, brought up to surface, uh, reconditioned, have the oil removed. Well, underground now you can use that material to actually pull the oil out of the water and actually continue and recycle the water so you have to bring less water underground. Hmm. You can do the same thing with air filtration. You can remove the ultra-fine particulates from the air. It's quite a remarkable product. It has a, has a lot of utility 
and we're really proud and happy to have this in Northern Ontario. Uh, we're licensing it out uh, globally right now. Uh, everything from uh, booms to from oil for uh, people who take care of oil spills uh, globally uh, to all the way down to even like insoles, uh, water filtration. We're working with the First Nation communities up north to basically take uh, diesel contamination out of their water. Huh. And uh, yeah, it's really doing some amazing things. In the best of all possible worlds, you can see this getting out there and making how much for you? Um, this is going to do really well. I, and I do think that it's going to leave a really good positive mark uh, akin to the, the dent the meteor left in Sudbury a long time ago and created the mining sector. <laughs> no, but it's going to do well. Um, one of the things that, you know, coming back to what uh, Don and, and Allison talked about earlier was that uh, one of the things I think can happen is that a lot of the mines in northern Ontario have um, most of their head offices out of Sudbury now because they've been sold. And for them to make decisions to implement a lot of these innovative technologies uh, is, is more difficult than it used to be. And in fact, a lot in the past, a lot of these mines, a lot of the workers used to come up with innovative ideas themselves and then implement them. But now with these head offices being elsewhere and the engineers being elsewhere, it makes it difficult for these things to come in. So I think uh, government can play a role in kind of saying, let's uh, set aside some funding to basically implement some of these new technologies into the mines and they could do it uh, sooner rather than waiting for the, the, the sales cycle and the mines to come through. I noticed you dodged my question a little bit about how much money you're going to make. I'm not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll Millions. chat later. We'll chat later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. SSMIC. Yes. What is that? The Sault Ste. Marie Innovation Centre. So similar to Don's organization, an innovation centre in Sault Ste. Marie. And I worked as the executive director there for 11 years, uh, working with startup companies and entrepreneurs. Uh, as well, they have an, an innovative GIS group within the Innovation Center. That GIS meaning? Geographic Information Systems. Okay. Uh, that employs about 20 people and has been recognized internationally for the work they've done with a community data platform. And what kind of jobs are you creating? Uh, you know, a lot of the jobs are software development, project management, entrepreneurs, business obviously, sales, marketing mm -hmm. roles. And uh, it's interesting, we had uh, an you know, venture capitalists come into Sault Ste. Marie, Angel Investor, and look at the companies, and he said, I love your companies in the north. Angel They've Investor meaning what? Someone with a lot of money looking to invest in companies and help them grow and develop in the future. Very early, early, early investor. Early stage. Stage. Yeah. High and he said, I love your companies. They've got really practical solutions. They're not trying to replicate the latest Silicon Valley technology. They've got problems that they're solving using technology that have wide application that are really valuable. Angel investors up here any different from anywhere else? Yes. They are? How so? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going back to your question as to you hear the, the data and the insight whereby, you know, maybe there isn't a ton of innovation going on. Well, I can tell you it's not the case. And there's a lot of things that are happening. And one of them relates to angel investment. So if you think of the innovation economy, the startup economy, if you will, there's kind of five things that startup companies need. You know, access to mentorship, access to capital, access to customers, uh, partners, and talent. Capital is a critical one, especially in the first, you know, two to three years when you're getting going. You need that kind of risk capital to overcome those early barriers. You know, not three and a half, four years ago, there was no active angel investment community in the city of Greater Sudbury. And there are people with immense wealth, if I can use that term, that are aging, and they have this capital that they've accumulated through success in the mining industry or some other industries that's arguably sitting in a bank account and it's dormant wealth looking for something to do. So your angel investors are local? Absolutely. They are, and, okay. And, but what, what's interesting though is the portfolio of companies that the Innovation Mill has been nurturing, again, it's a very diverse portfolio, notwithstanding the fact that the majority still are advanced manufacturing mining. Mm -hmm. But that said, you have these individuals that when you educate them and say, look, there's a really interesting deal, it's really interesting investments for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, they're local. The angel investors that are looking at these companies go, hmm, you know what, I, I, I think a meaningful return is a smart investment, but is there a way that I can adjust the term sheet, the conditions in which my investment goes into that company to ensure that that company will remain local? Because there's this, this, this difficult to describe civic pride amongst the rural hmm. communities in Northern Ontario that, hey, this community was good to me, I'll make an investment. Their financial return is important, but what's more important is this company will help create jobs for my grandchildren and their children mm. to keep the community going. So you don't see that in the large urban angel networks down in mm. Toronto or Waterloo. They're there to make an investment and get a return. Here, while that be true, there's a subtlety associated with that around, 
well, I want you to stay because I want to, I want to, you know, give something back to the community, give something for my children. It's a different mission. Can, yeah, different it's a different, but, but again, it's, it's a balance between yeah. that, which is and really when, unique to Northern Ontario. And when you add up all the Northern Ontario angel investors, we actually outgun every other angel community in Canada by deal flow and volume of deals. Huh. So it's quite an amazing stat. Okay, here's where I play Dr. Doom for a second here, okay? <laughs> Notwithstanding what everybody is saying here tonight, can we bring up this graphic, please? Since 2003, Northern Ontario has lost almost 15,000 full-time workers, and in that same time, the province as a whole gained almost 700,000 full-time workers. Northern Ontario's employment rate is a little over 54%. That's down 4.5% since 2003. 54% compares to Ontario's average employment rate, which is currently at 60%. By the year 2040, more than 30% of those residing in the North will be seniors. By that same time, Northern Ontario will require, get this, 75,000 workers to fill workplace shortages. Um, okay, Alicia, let's start us off here. Why, um, before we get to the future, let's talk about the present. Why are we still seeing so many jobs disappearing in Northern Ontario? Well, I mean, I think if you look at the mining cycle, or sorry, the mining industry, it's very cyclical. It has its ups and downs. Uh, so maintaining a workforce is, is quite a challenge. So what you're seeing are actually companies diversifying outside of mining, taking their existing products and services and seeing if they can actually transfer them to other industries. Also looking to diversify their offerings. So, you know, hopefully this is a way in which they can actually retain their workforce because we want to maintain, uh, you know, the people that we've trained and invested in. Um, so that's what we're doing at Marcotte Mining is we're looking at other industries and other product lines that we can develop. Tell me just a bit about Marcotte. How many employees? What are you mining? All that stuff. Uh, so at Marcotte Mining, we design and manufacture underground mobile equipment, and we're currently working on launching a, a line of battery electric vehicles uh, in partnership with Siemens, which we're really excited about. So it be zero emissions? Yes, exactly. Zero emission mining. So, you know, it's, it helps with the cost of ventilation, no emissions, uh, hmm. maintenance, health of the operator. There are so many benefits. Uh, and these are some of the great things that the mining industry is actually doing. So at Marcot, we have a little over 50 employees, and we actually manufacture everything in Sudbury. Most people think we manufacture down south, but we actually don't. We manufacture uh, in northern Ontario. So for those who say the cost of doing business in Ontario generally, but northern Ontario in particular, is too high, what are you saying? Well, I mean, there's definitely challenges. Um, you know, for a manufacturer or for the supply service sector, we are competing against the mining companies who are paying higher wages. So as an employer, we have to come up with other ways to attract uh, and retain that talented workforce. Let's get a little political here for a second. Uh, the government of Ontario passed a pretty significant new labor bill just before the parliament disbanded and uh, we're off into an election campaign. Can you tell us what kind of impact the new labor laws are having in your world? Uh, in respect to the labor laws, can you clarify? Well, obviously there's a much higher new minimum wage. There, yes. are, there are more regulations for the hiring of people and what kind of benefits you have to give them and so on and so forth. Well, I can definitely speak to the minimum wage increase. Okay. If I look at my own experience with Covergals being a startup and a small business, um, you know, I think there needs to be more consideration given to that next bracket of you know wages so not just the minimum wage but those people that were current you know previously making 15 to 19 dollars there's an expectation that they will also get that same bump that the minimum wage uh, you know so rate if was you're, if you're making 11 and now you're about to make 15 yeah the expectation if you're making 15 you're, you're going to want 20 18 or 19 if not more so you know that is a domino effect it's not just affecting the minimum wage but it's also affecting those next brackets up does that make doing business here harder it does. It does. It, eh? it, it does. In Northern Ontario, we what we should potentially be doing is creating a, a sort of an economic zone that slightly differs from Southern Ontario, because in the end, I don't think that we're necessarily trying to say let's let's draw off of Southern Ontario and make uh, in, balance it out. What we're trying to say is Northern Ontario has some unique offerings, and let's bring the globe. Like Donald Trump in the states is basically talking about getting rid of some of these immigrant uh, entrepreneurs and saying we don't want you anymore. Well, let's open up the doors and let's say if you want to come to Canada, we incentivize you, uh, but we'd like you to kind of start up potentially in Northern Ontario or just make it a, a tax zone that has a lower uh, cost to entry, uh, lower some lower energy rates for some of these large manufacturers. Mm. Uh, in Activated White, we've licensed some of our material out to make insoles, and they're making them in Mexico. I'd much prefer to do them up here in Sudbury or in Northern Ontario anywhere, but when you look dollar for dollar, it's very difficult to compete. Have you, Tom, heard anything in this election campaign about reversing brain drain, that kind of thing? 
There has been talk about how the North can develop and move forward and uh, recently the Northern Ontario Large Urban Mayors put out a paper talking about trying to establish an immigration pilot similar to the one in Atlantic Canada for Northern Ontario. And when you look at the numbers, you know, just uh, Algoma Steel, for example, they have 25% uh, of their workforce that's eligible to retire in the next three years. 700 workers there could retire today. Um, we know those workers are going to have to be replaced, and that's on top of other industry that we have that's, uh, you know, looking at an aging workforce, which is not unique to the north, but it's a bit compounded in northern Ontario. And so we have to get very good at uh, attracting and retaining uh, immigrants to northern Ontario. Well, let me, yeah, let me follow up on that, Alicia, because we, we, we did talk about how, you know, the overall job picture is down in the north, yeah. but there is going to be a crying need for new workers in northern Ontario <coughs> once all of these people start retiring. Yeah, I mean, do do we've, been, we've been talking about this for years. I mean, I don't know how many conferences and events and conversations I've participated in. There is, there there isn't going to be a shortage, there is a shortage today. You know, if you look at skilled trades, the shortage exists now. So what can we do to attract or retain people into those industries? I know on the CoverGal side, we're passionate about, you know, industry and engaging and attracting women um, because there's a lot of opportunity. There's well-paying jobs, there's opportunity for growth to be challenged. So at CoverGals, we're really focused on making, you know, young females and also older females aware of the opportunities that exist. You clearly love living in the North. I do. You know what, the quality of life up here, I mean, you know, Sudbury alone is home to 330 lakes and it's beautiful. So why is it, I mean, it's, it, you're from here, you, you know this place. If you're not from here and you don't know this place, what do you say to people to sort of pitch them on giving it a chance? Well, I mean, I say that, you know, we're home to 330 lakes. If you look at some of the attractions we have, we have Kiwi Park. It is an absolute beautiful place. It's a place to create memories with your family and friends, to get outside, explore the outdoors, uh, and create some memories. And if people say you're four hours away from a Blue Jay game, what do you say then? You drive. You, <laughs> fly, well, order. And, and I have a very personal connection to that because I am not from here. I lived in Toronto for the previous 13, 14 years until I moved here. Mm -hmm. And that question comes up all the time. What's it like? And the simplest way I can describe it, it's like the northern Muskokas. Yeah. That a Toronto person can relate to. Go, oh, really? Lots of lakes, lots of nature. And yet you have this vibrant community of interesting companies and good services and infrastructure, engaged government, all these things that make this community an absolutely wonderful place to be. Can I pick up on that issue of government? There, there, are, there are a lot of businesses and a lot of people in northern <clears throat> Ontario that very much disproportionate to their confrères in the south depend on government to make it. Is that problematic? Well, let me get to Tom on that. You start yeah. on that, Tom. Yeah, you know, I think um, there certainly it's a good stable base of jobs for the northern economy and it's important to the economy now. I think going forward, though, the activities at uh, the, the mill and the innovation center, our entrepreneurs here, you know, growing those entrepreneurs' private sector jobs are important for the growth of northern Ontario. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of effort being made to foster that generation of entrepreneurs and make sure we're attracting and retaining our youth um, you know, to make sure they stay here. You know, if they go away to university, they come back to Northern Ontario. And there's a lot of effort in doing that, and it's really important to the future of the North. And that, in that regard, uh, you know, there's some policy changes that can be made in terms of even Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, where um, up until now, these tech jobs, because a lot of the youth actually is very much into coding and into creating software. And there's a, 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 a one company that I, that I know called TimeHero.com, and it had created this hub and a really good product productivity management and software, but NOHFC wasn't allowing the start the uh, the owners, uh, because they owned, they were starting it, they were doing it for free, because that's typically what you do in tech, they weren't allowed to get funding because uh, the way it was structured was for the old economy, not old economy, the, the more of a structured mining, forestry kind of thing. And when, in startups, you, you, you need to get these tech entrepreneurs um, uh, to understand that, you know, they are giving their blood, sweat and tears, so the NOHFC needs to gear a little bit into that. And, and, and that's been a really interesting I'll call it discussion and point amongst the three political parties right now. And Northerners care about the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. As I, again, I go back to the needs of the early stage tech companies and, and why their needs are important. Well, they will drive the majority of jobs for our community, so we need to figure out how to solve their problems. One of them is access to capital. And we've, I think we have a good strategy to solve the angel capital program. We have an aging population with lots of money. Let's get them involved and educated but there's still a critical role for government funding to help these companies kind of prime the pump, get over that chasm and move on. And I think, you know, some of the discussions around, you know, what, uh, what each party will do with the fund, some have opted to increase it, some have maintained it, some want to change a bit of the rules. 
getting that right for Northern Ontario, especially the tech ecosystem and entrepreneurial ecosystem, should be a critical decision variable that the entrepreneurial communities across the North listen to and pay attention to up, leading up to the election. Tom, having said that, I often hear that the, the saddest export from Northern Ontario is young people. And I wonder how often you hear in Sault Ste. Marie, parents say to their kids, you got to go south to get your education. I hope you come back, but how often do you hear that? Yeah, unfortunately, it still happens. It's uh, less so now than it used to be. I know, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s, I think that was a very common refrain. And people saying you're going to have to leave to get a job and pursue a career. We still hear a bit of that now. We try our best to stamp that out when we can because we know there are jobs available. And we know there's the opportunities to support our youth in our communities to help them grow and build a career there or a business there, ideally. So it's something we're working on, and I think it's something uh, we just had a Sioux Summit where we got together with a group of people that were from the Sioux living in the GTA, hmm. and uh, just a fantastic group of people, very accomplished and skilled. And I looked around that room, I said, boy, if we still had all that talent and horsepower in our community, how great would it be? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is they're still very passionate about giving back to their hometown, mm -hmm. and they want to get involved. So we're going to take advantage of that and, and help grow. You, you really can't leave the north, can you, in some you respects? No. It's always in you, isn't it? That's right. No, it's always That's in right. you. Do you hear this in Sudbury as well, where people feel, notwithstanding the fact that we're sitting here in a fine university, I got to go south to get an education? Well, I mean, I think I would agree with Tom, but I mean, there's some, you know, besides the institutions that we have here, you know, there's also research and innovation centers. But I think one thing that employers can do, uh, you know, if those students are going to school in northern Ontario is, uh, you know, placements. Placements is, is really important. I mean, employers say they're looking for, you know, they're looking for employees, but they have no experience. Well, as employers, we need to give them experience. So mm -hmm. taking placement students, you know, at Markel Mining, we work very actively with Cambrian College and taking placement students all the time. So at any given time, you'll probably find at least one to three students in our office gaining knowledge, giving them the experience that they need so when they graduate, they can go into the industry with some knowledge. Can I ask you a nasty question? Yeah. Do you pay them? No, but we do compensate them um, through other means after. But no, they're unpaid yeah. placements. Um, but the goal is to give them, you know, an, some knowledge and experience and then bring them back to your workplace after. Okay. And it's, it's not just about education, right? Yeah. Like a lot of, uh, for example, in the suburb, we have a, over 100, 150,000 people. We had no facility for uh, the kids and adults to play uh, indoor green sports, uh, football, soccer, mm -hmm. any of these kinds of things. And the, the government now, thankfully, has, has uh, put in a $4 million to help us build a dome so that for eight months of the year we can actually do these activities instead of having to uh, travel down south, which kind of puts a little, a little bug in their ear and makes them think, geez, this is something we have to do. We have to go down south to get these amenities. Yeah. But we can have them up here in the north. So look for those gaps and let's fill them. Is there a typical pitch that you would give to an immigrant to say, leave Toronto, a city half of immigrants, yep. come up here? I would argue that in some respects it's, it's already starting to happen. And I, I think back to the debate a couple of nights ago where Andrew Horvath made the comment that 40% of young people in urban centres like Toronto and Vancouver can't afford it. So they're looking to, to, to emigrate somewhere. Yep. So there's an awareness campaign that needs to be done by champion entrepreneurial ambassadors. These mm -hmm. individuals, when they go down and say, here's what I'm accomplishing, here's what I'm doing, that resonates. So you could take uh, you know, somebody coming in from a different country, or now I would argue there's a sales proposition to the large urban centres where the cost of living is becoming very problematic. There are communities in, in the city of Greater Sudbury, it's only four hours away. There are good paying jobs, and if it's a young person, money's not the primary motivator for that job anymore. Mm -hmm. They're looking for unique experiences. Yeah, meaningful. Well, I meaningful. Think they're looking well, for meaningful. social purpose, right? It's about well, social and, yeah. and giving back. And, and, and engagement. And if you think of the transformation right now that the mining, is under, uh, mining industry is going through, and, and to speak about that just as a representative example, the mining industry, like no other time, is going through a technology adoption renaissance like mm -hmm. no other before. And if you look at a young individual in Toronto and you say, do you want to work in the mining industry? No, I don't want to spend you know, 12 hours a day doing that job. But given the investments of the mining industry in new technologies, now you can present an opportunity to someone wanting to, uh, to, to escape the GTA, to come up you know, four hours north to the northern Muskokas, to have a job that's utilizing uh, uh, an, an iPad to control an autonomous or teleremote vehicle underground from a coffee shop like environment. So they've still got an image of their in their head of somebody with soot all over their well, face coming up from a mile below. And so, the mining industry yeah. can do certainly a job in, in, in changing that perception. I mean, you know, to build on that, Don, you've got Gold Corp uh, up at Muscle White where they actually are, you know, remotely controlling vehicles in Thunder Bay. 
even though their mine site <laughs> is, you know, how many hundred kilometers away. So there's actually people in Thunder Bay operating the vehicles underground, which means, you know, obviously cost reduction, safety of the of the person because mm -hmm. they're not underground with the equipment. And, and, and that doom and gloom of the labor shortage of 75,000 workers across northern Ontario, I can, I can presuppose that the majority of those are related to mining, mining supply service and forestry. Probably the majority would be allocated to that. Mm -hmm. If we can do a better job at educating, inspiring, you know, encouraging the academic institutions to develop programs that realize that the future of mining and the new world of work in mining is very different, I don't think the shortage will be as doom and gloom as you think because people will be, well, I actually would love to move to a northern Ontario community, hmm. be it in steel or manufacturing or mining, and I can actually make this my job, using a game controller to do something <laughs> or focus on electrification, do something yes. interesting. Oh, utilizing I, I, drones. Utilizing <laughs> drones underground. So I think there's a renaissance transformation that has already started and it's only going to continue to accelerate okay. and I think it'll address a it's major... A, it's about the speed of innovation uh, uh, and, you know, it's great. We, like, even in the forestry sector, for example, like uh, modifying uh, some technologies, like with Activated White, we're working with FP Innovation out of Quebec to embed, embed, uh, embed the product into paper. So it gives it a new life and, and actually extends uh, hmm. the way it's being used. So it's, it's, it's getting innovation into uh, the hands of the people of the North and, and getting Alicia, them invested in. Alicia, can we talk about a Johnny Cash song here for a second? Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> we were hoping you'd go there. Yeah. <laughs> can you sing a couple of bars? We no, want to talk to about the Ring of Fire here yes. for a bit because there's supposedly $60 billion in the ground there, yeah. 5,500 potential new jobs, and frankly, not a heck of a lot going on. What, what have you seen from any of the, let's talk a little politics, what have you seen from the four major political parties that gives you any hope that that thing is one day closer to getting developed? I mean, there's, you know, one of the parties has talked about more talks need to be have. I mean, we've been talking about the Ring of Fire for years and years now. Um, other parties have talked about invest in the road and get the infrastructure in place. And that's what we need to do. We need to build the road. We also need to facilitate relationships with the Indigenous communities. We need to talk to those communities that are going to be affected by the road going in. There's a lot of opportunity up there, but we've been talking about it for a number of years now. And now we need to move on to execution. Well, let's just, uh, before I get everybody else in, in on this, uh, for the record, let's say the NDP is going to put a billion dollars into the project. If they win, the Liberals say they'd pony up a billion as well, continue working on building the access road. The Greens have a similar approach, although a, a, certainly a, 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 an approach of sustainable development. The Conservatives say there has been too much talk, and Doug Ford has said he's going to hop on a bulldozer himself to build that road if he has to do it. Who's got the right approach here? Any idea? Well, I think they're all saying similar things, right? At the end of the day, the, ec the economics of the situation will drive it. Uh, if it makes economic sense to do it and we have the, the buy-in from the indigenous communities, yeah. um, I, I, I think we need to move forward. It's, it's very much like, you know, we talked about forever four-laning, uh, you know, northern Ontario and connecting suburb mm -hmm. to Toronto and, and, and North Bay. And it just takes time, right? So I, I think that we can't let the, the perfect be the enemy of, of what we want to do here and, and achieve it. Um, whether, you know, it's going to take Doug Ford to get on a, 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 a bulldozer, bulldozer or not, uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen. But Everyone seems to be saying the same thing, so I think it's going to happen, um, and it's important that it happens, but let's continue on with all these other innovative projects as well that are, that are going on. Tom, what is the biggest thing inhibiting the Ring of Fire from being developed so far? I think it is just the, the agreements on how to actually proceed on building that road and getting the actual shovels in the ground, if you will, on the project. And Sault Ste. Marie was one of the proponents bidding on the ferrochrome processing facility mm -hmm. and I think in a lot of the discussions we've had there's a real opportunity for that project to benefit all of Northern Ontario and there's a real opportunity to work together to make it happen and I think you know there's will now from all the parties and, and you know with their platforms to try and make that a reality. Again I don't want to harp on the negative but the fact is that, that big American mining company, the Cliffs, yep. went home. Caesars. They went home. They had enough of waiting around. They just didn't think anybody up here could put the puck in the net. So with that kind of publicity out there, uh, do you wonder whether this thing's ever going to get done? Well, I go back to, to Dennis's comment. There's clear recognition amongst all three parties that Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, we are global leaders in all that is mining. Okay, but this is 500 kilometers north of Thunder Bay. Right. It's it is in a here. very isolated area. But, the, you know, there's a lot of complexities with the negotiation. And, you know, every four years the parties change or bureaucrats change or the political figures change. So there's an appreciation that there's some, some continuity gaps that have happened. And when Cliffs came in to, to do what they wanted to do, 
Uh, I think they underestimated the amount of complex negotiations with the various First Nations mm -hmm. that are connected ultimately to where the ore body is and how to get it back. Uh, I think that has proved to be an exceptional lesson learned. And if you look at the work that Noron is doing, they're engaging oh, various yes. communities, they're talking. That's they're, the Ontario-based miner. Yeah, yes. yeah, up in northern Ontario, leading a huge amount of exploration right now. Mm -hmm. And the way that they're doing it, I think, is a wonderful model, looking at rev revenue share models, which many of the parties have talked about and how to make that work. But it's recognizing that, you know, that metaphorically speaking, the getting on a bulldozer and driving it through probably isn't the right <laughs> model in doing so. But we're close and we're moving it and, and it, there needs to be recognition that it's a complex negotiation and it's going to take time, but it will happen. It's too important to our country. Alicia, yeah. i got about a minute left here. Do you think yeah. this thing is actually going to happen? Yeah, I Ring hope of fire? so. I, I, yeah. I know you hope so. Everybody <laughs> hopes so. But here we are 10 years later still talking about it. Still, still talking about building roads. Well, I mean, that, what, that is one of the challenges in terms of, you know, the length of time it takes to bring any mining operation into production. You know, from exploration to, you know, development to production, it's a long timeline. So perhaps the government can look at how do you expedite that process? Um, how do you bring new operations online? Does anybody think any one party has a better solution than any other party? As it pertains to the Ring of Fire? As it pertains to, yes, getting that thing going. Anybody got... Like lightning in a bottle on this that we just don't know about yet? <laughs> There's still too much ambiguity with the Conservative Party. Uh, I think, mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the bulldozer, again, phrase makes it a bit confusing as to what exactly they're thinking. And I think they would admit that, that they don't have a detailed plan as to what that would look like. Mm -hmm. But I can't point to one single party that might have a better solution. The thing that I'm most excited by is that there's agreement amongst all three that this is very important for the future economic prosperity of our province. So let's figure it out but I can't comment on which one might be better. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's the last word. I want to thank everybody for joining us here at Laurentian University in Sudbury uh, for a, a most interesting discussion on Northern Ontario. Don Duvall, CEO, Sudbury-based NORCAT. Dr. Dennis Reich, Northern Ontario Angel Investor, CEO of Activated White. Alicia Woods, General Manager, Marcotte Mining. She's also Director of the Centre for Excellence in Mining Innovation and the creator of Cover Gals. Got to show us some of that yes, sometime. For sure. And Tom Vare, Deputy CAO, Community Development and Enterprise Services, Sioux St. Marie. Thanks, all. Thank, Thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.